View. It'll do bump steer, but it won't do anything else uh, in, in the Z, in the, the four half dimension. So briefly, how to use this thing. Um, this is how you edit points. So you click that, and now you have control of the points. This button is more for editing. This one will turn on steering arms, and now you can do bump steer. The other important one is the, the chassis rotation. That will um, toggle that so that you can, so if I do that, then I can only move the chassis up and down, which is actually helpful. Um, with it off, then you can start to roll it 
Rapoport and Buffett at the same time. But usually we look at bump alone before we look at um, the, the whole behavior, particularly for Baja. So you need to include, unfortunately I can't zoom in that far because the text on the bottom is important. Let's see, is this full screen? Yes. Excellent. Okay, there we go. So um, let's look at their default suspension and see how it behaves and then see if we can improve it. Uh, this is green dot is the roll center. That pink dot is the instant center of this wheel. You can see the, this arm points to there and this arm points to there. So that means at this moment in time, this wheel is rotating about that point. But as you pull the car, let's say down into bump, so I'm pulling the car down, that's equivalent to the wheels hitting a bump. You can see that that instant center is, is there audio somewhere? <laughs> <laughs> hearing things. Um, uh, you can see that this center is moving both down and closer to the other wheel. So the closer this instant center is to that wheel, the faster the camera will change as um, the wheel moves in increment. <clears throat> For off-road cars, we probably don't really want that because we're going to be experiencing more wheel travel up and down just due to bumps than we are due to roll. So, um, and, and also since um, camber, we don't have to maintain this negative camber for off-road cars because they're rounded tires. Um, well, that may be different for uh, the little slow. They probably have some, they have, they have flat tires. So camber's probably more important than them, but um, their bump behavior is still more important. So uh, that means we'd like to we want to prioritize the vert vertical motion more than the horizontal motion. So let's see, let's look at one thing, which is uh, how much does the camber change when we move the vehicle one inch? So uh, right now, I am at the default height. And the right height, you can see, is in the parentheses, it says zero inches, right height 4.75. So if I move this car down one inch, there, the camber changed by 1.4 degrees, that's the bottom right. And that would be um, a fair amount. Oop, I'm rolling, sorry, let me turn on the roll. Uh, we probably, in an off-road, that probably would be fine for a streetcar, but in an off-road car we probably want less. Another thing you look at, and this is for the handling behavior, is how does the roll center track the chassis? Remember the roll moment? That was the distance between the center of gravity and the roll center. So that roll moment is how much causes the vehicle to try to roll over. You like that roll moment arm to stay constant throughout all right heights. That way the car be, uh, handles the same at all right heights. So look at the distance between the blue and the green. Much Now it's getting much, much closer and there it's getting further away. So that's, for handling behavior, that's not particularly what you want. You'd like that, them to track each other together, not um, get closer to each other. Let's see, we also see the roll center is pretty close to the ground. Uh, that's shown. like the roll center to be higher so that we don't need to depend on springs to keep the car from rolling. Another thing you look at is you don't want the bottoms of the tires to be changing their width as the car goes up and down. So that there the, the tires get pulled in and there they get pushed apart. Uh, the more they scrub like that, the less supple the suspension will be to changes. So what's one thing you think we can do to keep that scrub from happening so much in general. So why are the tires pulling in so much? It's because the arms are vertical. So we'd like to keep the arms um, more horizontal. So if I want the car to go, let's say, up that high, and I don't want those arms to be so vertical, 
what can I do? Can those red uh, joints pivot at all? The red joints? Like the red bars, can yeah. they yeah. bend yeah. Like with it at all? Um, so this would be called the upright, and that will be a rigid it structure. Works. Yeah, you, um, there's not really a feasible way of messing with that. A few people have tried, and it, sometimes it works, but most of the time it doesn't. Okay. Um, so uh, it's maybe too simple of a question. Um, the main thing is just make the arms longer. So if they're that high and they're that angled, then by making them longer, they will flatten out. So let's um, try that. So now let's try edit. So I'm going to pull those in. And I'll pull these in. First of all, just stick with kind of a square chassis like they did. <coughs> yeah, so I want that. Now I can go all the way up here and you can see those wheels are not moving in as much. So that would be a more supple suspension. Um, let's see. Next thing is look at the, um, just by doing that, I made the, see the green dot relative to the blue chassis? It's not moving, they're moving more together, right? The green dot is not accelerating towards the blue chassis as much, and that's also because of the long arms. Uh, the trick to getting the green and the blue to stay um, even with each other is to have unequal length arms. That's the usual trick. I do something like that. Now the green is following the blue very nicely. And if I do a little bit more, I probably can get them to be line on line. There we go. Green and blue moving totally together. So that's why unequal length arms are often used, to keep that roll center um, at the same relative height. Off-road, it's desirable, but not as critical. Let's see, looking outboard, let's look out here first, actually. Um, so here's the kingpin angle. See this right here? 13 degrees. And it's also giving the scrub radius 3 and 3 eighths. So the scrub radius, remember, is you take these two points, draw a line, they intersect there. And so it's the difference between the center of the tire and there. So scrub radius is not good. Uh, that makes her higher forces in the suspension. It means the wheels have to like, um, go through space just in order to turn. You'd like the wheel just to turn right on their own contact patch. So um, as you might guess, we want to move that point out. Now I've got the scrub down to one inch, but I've got a huge kingpin angle of 20. So I'm going to pull this over. And the usual goal is to get this, this is called the lower ball joint, get it as far out as possible. You almost always want it right next to the brake disc. Uh, Packaging-wise, it's um, <clears throat> the way the package works. Let's see. Here's the inner rim. Here's the tire, etc. Um, the cap. Let's see. The caliper. You fit it. The brake caliper. You fit in it as close as you can. Then that defines where the brake disc goes. So that's the, the contact right there, whatever's comfortable there. Uh, the brake disc goes here, and usually you try to get the lower ball joint right up against the brake disc. Within reason, you know, not thousands of an inch, half an inch, quarter inch. Uh, so if we put that out there, then. Um, if I, I, want, I don't want too much kingpin, I'd like it to be under 15 degrees. So, and I, but I also want the scrub radius to be like one inch or so, and I can get that in this situation. Scrub less than one, kingpin less than 15. And that also gives you longer arms, so it's a win-win. So for a static ride height, this would be a very close instant center um, for an off-road car. That would be more like a road racing car for its ride height instant center. We'd probably want that point to be, for off-road, further out. 
So another observation is our roll center is too low. Um, it's only two inches off the ground. So uh, we want to get that up and we want to get this out. So these outer points are usually fixed by the wheel geometry, right? Lower ball joint there. Upper ball joint can be, there's two classic places for it. One would be like kind of inside the rim there. And the other would be way outside the tire. They both have advantages. Uh, and that, of course, affects your inboard points. So you start with those, and then you say, um, if I want my roll instance center to be further out, what do I need to do to these invert points and also get the roll center up? How can I, if I want that point to be, let's say, over here, what do I need to do to those? Raise the chassis, turn the hanging right arm. Yeah, so let's raise that one and raise this one. There, there we go. Now it's further out. Uh, I also don't have enough ground clearance. Right height is six inches. So um, that's the difference between, there it is, you can see six inches. You need, what, 10 or 12? So how can we get enough ground clearance and preserve um, the instances that are far away? We're gonna have to move everything up. So that's why you see Baja cars not with, so in street cars, this lower ball joint is as close as possible uh, to the rim, usually about, about here. Baja just, we gotta have ground clearance, so we have to move this one up. So we're gonna move that one up then this one kind of wants to be up here. That would be a better place for it. You could put it here, but it's gonna make everything very tight, um, and the forces will get higher, as we'll talk about later. So I've got that one about on wheel center line. Let me get myself, actually, let me start with my ground clearance. I need to have, let's say, 10 inches of ground clearance. Then, um, See, things start to get very tight here if I try to, oh, I, I've got the wrong rim too. This is a 13 inch diameter rim, right? Is all Baja 10? 10 inch wheels, 10 inch rims? I don't know if there's a, I don't think there's one of it, but just practically speaking, I think everything I've seen has been 10 inch. Um, 10 inch wheel will be much uh, lighter than a 13 as well. So that's your unsprung weight argument. So let me bring the rim down to this hitting bring the room down to 10. So if I try to keep that upper ball joint inside the rim, I can do it and also have ground clearance. I'm cheating a little bit here, but you can cheat more on ground clearance out here than you can here. Why? Why do you need more ground clearance in the middle? Because that's cool. it's actually that's moving up and down. Or and another way of saying it is that um, the outer wheel is following the road. So if, if the road goes up here, the wheel goes with it. Yeah. If the road goes up here, yeah. wham. So you can afford to have this, this length angled down slightly as it goes out. Okay. But um, if you only have a few inches between this point and this point, so right now I have four inches in between them, and I have, let's see, now you see this is where you have to do mechanics and kinematics at the same time. Um, the height of that lower ball joint is, let's see, it's somewhere here. I thought they told you. I guess they don't say on this one. The lower control arm? Yeah. Yeah, that's the length of it down here, 20 inches long. Um, it probably is somewhere else, like if I save the data. I bet if I save the data, I could, I could get that point. But um, it looks like it's about nine inches off the ground. So let me, let's look at now forces. This, is, this matters for, uh, if you're going around a turn, you have a big point there. Okay, and let's um, put our ball joint say over there and upper here. So this distance is nine inches. 
And this distance is, um, well, this is four more. So this is 13 inches. And as I do, uh, what I'd like to know is how beefy do these arms have to be in order to absorb that force? Uh, and that will also play into the vertical force, the, the distance between them. So this boils down to a sum of the moments problem. Sum of the moments, and let's see, I can pick, oh, so let me complete the picture here, sorry. Okay, so this is all one piece. So when I put that force on, basically my free body diagram, you could eat, well, I could do it right here. There's a force there and a force there. Let me simplify it and just make these horizontal so, so that I don't have to work so hard on my map. It's the same idea. So this is F1, this is F2. If I take some of the moments about uh, either at that point or at that point, I can solve for my system. Why don't I do the upper ball joint? Some of the moments about the upper, and I'll put this U and uh, L. Then that's zero. And I have four inches times FL. And then I have 13 inches times the force at the um, ground. And let's see, let me get directions here. Um, this is going around counterclockwise, so that's a positive. This is going around clockwise, so that's a negative. Therefore, FL equals 13 over 4 times F. And so you can see the force in this arm is going to be multiplied by the ratio of that distance to this distance. So this is why streetcars always try to get, or if you could, ground clearance were not an issue, we would try to get this point down here. That would re both reduce the, um, let's see, that would increase the form. We still have a 13, but it would increase the 4 by a lot. So it'd be 13 over like 8. Now you can reduce the force in this a lot. That means it's going to be a stronger arm for a given weight. And its load on the chassis is going to be less, so that point's uh, less likely to break. So, but we got our ground clearance. Um, so the tricks you can do are one, cheat the arm down, you know, it doesn't have to be level. And two, um, maybe. I've seen some cars like this. You do put it down there, or you put it somewhat down, and you have a bent arm. <laughs> that gives you the ground clearance. Now, that introduces huge bending forces in this arm. So um, maybe, I'm not saying you should do this or not, I don't know, but um, since we know we have to have a string, string perch, um, maybe you integrate that into the spring load. Now that the, the reason this might work is when you put this, this is, uh, so if you go around a corner, uh, left turn, this is the outside force, that's the biggest cornering force. The inside, the inside wheel doesn't carry much. Um, this force will put this arm in compression. That's making this wheel want this uh, arm try to do that. Look what the spring force does. Right. So that has potential. <laughs> Now, there are other cases where it doesn't have as much potential. If I put a bump force on, and now you have a spring force, but you don't really have that force. But you could design this arm, well, you have to design this arm anyway to take the spring force. So it's going to have to be this tall at that point anyway. So it's a little bent as it goes through its motion. That might be OK. But the point where the FL is applied, it doesn't really change, so. Ah, uh, yeah, that's a good observation. So, so uh, this helps my forces here, but look what I've done to my instant center. Now, by, by dropping this point to here and not dropping this point, this is now going up in the air, maybe too high. Yeah, so you gotta watch that too. So maybe some kind of compromise. Maybe I can cheat it down a little, maybe have a little bend. Okay, uh, these are some of the games you can play. Um, and well, it's just this is good engineering, you know, thinking about these things. Uh, the other way I can decrease this FL, of course, 
is by increasing the score another way. Raise that point. Put it up. Um, well, certainly, if you want to stay inside the rim, then that would be a good spot. But it's fine to get outside the rim. There's cars that have it up here. That has another advantage in that you can see that the chassis is very tiny here. If this is only four inches here, this is only four inches here. So it becomes a, a difficult frame to build. So this, um, one of the things I think you're going to see if you haven't already is how chassis uh, suspension decisions have a real strong effect on frame decisions. And so if you only know one, it's hard to make good decisions. Okay. Um, let's see. So let me not pursue that yet because that's kind of a what a little bit of a wild idea. I've seen it before, but um, it's unusual. Uh, let's stick with it inside the rim for now and see where we get. Um, oh, and I don't know, I haven't actually checked this tire diameter. They say it's a 185, 75, 10, and I don't know if that's a true um, close to a bottom -off tire, so you have, you have to check that. Let's see, so where were we? Um, this is probably the lower arm we want. I mean, I could pull it in even more. I mean, that would be great, actually, if I could pull that off as a suspension. That becomes a very difficult frame to design. Because now you have lots of loads into, like, just nothing's there. <laughs> um, so let's separate them by some distance. Oh, and so this also affects your pedal package. Are the pedals going to be in this region, or are they going to be behind that? If they're going to be in that region, four inches is not enough. Not enough to the pedal package. You're going to have to get, like, six, probably, to get the master cylinder and such. The steering rack is going to have to go in that area too, isn't it? Yeah, steering rack placement is a great question. Yeah. Most of them are between 11 and 14 inch steering racks. Ah, right. So if the steering rack is, is too um, long itself, then you can't possibly get these points that close. Right. Didn't think of that. Good. Yep. So, um, what so does that all have to be contained within the chassis, the steering rack and everything? Well, the important thing about the steering rack is that the, that the tie rod point, it has to be, um, and so what pressures do you put it above, near the top, near the bottom, or in the middle? Um, and the outer point as well. But um, if this point, let's say this is the tie rod, if it's out here, then you're going to have bump steer because it's not possible to put the outer point. Um, let me start with the simple bump steer explanation and then we'll go to the complex one. Um, the simple way of minimizing bump steer, so I'm going to go to inside the rim, conventional suspension. way of minimizing bump steer is you put the tie rod on this dotted line and that dotted line and you make it point at the same instant center that these point at. If you do that, so they're all pointing at the same point, your bump steer will be very, very good. Um, for Ackerman, remember Ackerman? That's where the inside wheel turns more than the outside wheel. Now it depends on, you know, this is actually so interrelated, maybe I don't want to go this far out. Um, let me skip the acumen discussion and just say, another thing you can do to these points is slide them both out or both in, as long as they still point at the same distance center. You can slide a certain degree and it probably still be very, very good. Um, you're probably going to want the steering rack behind the front wheels. That's better for Ackerman. And if you do that, um, this point, let's see, also wants to be a little bit inward, but it, it could stay. It might, well, we'd have to look at the Ackerman question, I'm not sure. Uh, the, the point is that 
you can move this point a little bit in and out, and you probably will want to for Ackerman, but you're absolutely right that we also have to consider the physical size of the steering rack. Or you make your own rack. You could make your own rack, it's not that hard. But so the, like if you have an 11 inch steering rack, it has to mount on either side to the chassis, is that yeah. the restriction? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that, so if you have an 11 inch rack, if you put it on the upper part, then you can see the upper is naturally wider. So that would make sense. However, um, now we have the rim, some rim issues. <coughs> if I look at the rim this way, our lower ball, lower ball joint is probably going to be around here. If our upper ball joint is inside the rim, let's say it's there, if you try to mount the rack high up, then you need to have a steering arm. Let's say this is the front of the vehicle, that's the rear of the vehicle. Uh, so that's your caster angle, that's your trail. Uh, the steering arm does not fit inside the rim up here. You want, it wants, we want it to be inside the rim, we want the steering arm to be like, let's say there, But if that's the rim, you can't get it inside the rim there. You can only get it if you drop it, let's say, to there. Okay, so if the steering arm is there, and like that, then this point's going to want to be here or so. And why did this matter? Related to your question. Remind me of your question. Oh, I was just wondering what the constraints on the steering rack were and how it fits yeah. inside the chassis. Oh, yeah. so I it's, wasn't it's, it's its height. <coughs> right, okay. That was the driving factor. Okay. We'd like it to be high up because these points are naturally further apart for good kinematics. That's 10 inches apart. This is 6 inches apart. So um, we want to get as high as possible, but we also have to fit inside the rim. And then the third issue is the, um, the driver's feet. It has to either be above or below or in front of the driver's feet. So we got a lot of pa interesting packaging issues here. Uh, my guess is the best way to solve them will be a combination of SolidWorks modeling, like so they have a mannequin in SolidWorks, um, and some uh, mock-ups. Get some wood and um, or cardboard tubing and build little pretend frames and sit inside it. And we'll look at other solutions, other people that have solved this problem. So this, the packaging here is definitely interesting. Uh, Dr. Mackey? Yeah. When you're talking about uh, placement of the ball joints, um, the upper ball joint, what are the cons of getting it outside of the rim? Like, I feel like it's inevitably going to have to be outside of the rim. Okay. Most people don't. Um, but you're right that, that it, there's a lot of advantages of putting it outside. I think the only disadvantage is that the upright, this structure here, is heavier. Okay. Okay. That is the only disadvantage I can think of. <coughs> probably not a lot heavier though. Yeah. We're probably talking a half now. Yeah. Wouldn't it change the uh, axis, the steering axis, or no? Yes, yeah, it's right. For the like scrub radius and whatever? Assuming you want to keep the same scrub radius and the same kingpin, then you have to make sure that wherever you move it, it goes on that blue line. And so that's why it tends to end up being up and outside the tire. Is it strong enough? Yeah. Like the material, is it steel or yeah. is it steel? Or like, how does it, can it handle that long of a? Yes, you probably you would use a steel tube, um, maybe a chromoly tube. Oh, and then uh, let's do continue our force analysis. We found that um, FL, actually first, I know I'm jumping around a lot. How many people are following? <laughs> okay, great. <laughs> FL, I, I don't, someday I'll write a, learn how to teach suspension kinematics in a logical way, but I always find if I do one thing, oh, no, you gotta know about this, and then you gotta know about this. It's inevitable. Um, FL was 13 over 4 times F, the ground contact force. What is F upper? So what, how can I get F upper? Let me go back to my 4 and my 13.
what equation would I use? Or what frequency? Yeah. Some of the forces equal to zero. Yeah, I can do the lateral forces equal zero. Um, I could also do moments about that point. You're always allowed to do another moment equation if you throw away one of your force equations. Uh, and the, the moment equations are nice because they can usually give the answer in one step. Um, if I did some of the forces, uh, it would give me the answer, but I have to do a two-step solution, a back substitution. If I do some of the moments there, now, um, let's see, some of the moments about the lower ball joint is zero. And now I have a nine times the F, and I have a four times the F U, F upper. And let's see, if I'm here, this one goes around clockwise, so that's a negative. The F U, um, that one, oh, that's, the way I've drawn it, I drew it like that. That goes around clockwise, so it's a negative. Um, I'm, oh, I'm, I'm drawing a compression. Um, so the lower ball joint is indeed in compression. The upper uh, arm is in tension because you get a minus sign. Oh, there's a four there. So it's nine over four times F. So the, um, the observation here is that the upper arm force is always less than the lower arm force. Nine over four, 13 over four. Uh, or another way of saying it is that the, the lower arm force is always the highest. Uh, it's the highest of any of them. The more spread you have between, uh, in other words, I can increase that four, that helps both the lower and the upper. That four shows up in both. So let's see. That mattered because of your question. If you raise the upper ball joint, it'll raise the 13 and the four. Right. And you asked about structure. And so since this is not a very high force, uh, relatively speaking to the lower one, um, we can probably get a steel tube in there to take that load without much trouble. And, oh, and if we raise it, its force goes down. So the higher you raise it, the less force, the less the structure has to carry. Um, 